It's the Cube covering OpenStack Summit 2017. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation, Red Hat, and additional ecosystem support. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman, joined by my co-host John Troyer. Happy to welcome back to the program uh, the, the two keynote MCs for the first two days, uh, Jonathan Bryce, who's the Executive Director, and Mark Hollier, who's the COO of OpenStack Foundation. Both of you, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us back. Yeah, All right, great so, to be on theCUBE. And thank you to the Foundation. You know, without your guys' support, we, we couldn't do this. It's our fifth year doing the show. I remember the first year John Furrier went, they were like, hey, OpenStack's arrived, the Cube's there. <laughs> and now uh, it, it's part of our regular rotation. I know our community loves it. Uh, community, open source, big part of the show. Uh, I wish we had like two hours to kind of tease out all the pieces, but Mark, I got to start with you. You just did a live Q&A <laughs> with Edward Snowden. Um, somebody joked, they said the quality and the sound was too good. He was sitting in the back room uh, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, can you just tell us, how did this come about and sure. how do you make that work? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, pinch me. Is this, is this real life? I keep, keep asking myself, it yeah. seems kind of surreal. But, uh, you know, just, just briefly, I, a lot of people have been asking, you know, how do, how do we get connected with them? It's kind of a, a funny story, but basically, um, Several years ago, when the whole story uh, came out about somebody from the government, from the NSA, had leaked these documents, but nobody knew who it was. And, uh, and I was on vacation. It was in the summer. I forget what year. I was on vacation with my family, and, uh, and we were in the lobby of this hotel when we were on vacation. And I've been following the story with some interest, and all of a sudden I see on the, the TV screen in the lobby of the hotel, breaking news, we're about to reveal the name of the leaker. And I look up, and I'm watching it with intently, and it says, you know, here it is, it's Edward Snowden. So the first thing I did is I pull up my phone, I immediately look and see if edwardsnowden.com is available. So I registered it, <laughs> thinking, well, this might come in handy. Yeah. This person just became the most famous person in the world, possibly. So, I, so it was available. So I'm like, I'm fur furiously typing on my phone, trying to register the domain. So I register the domain edwardsnowden.com. No idea what I would actually do with it, just thinking, if it's there, you know, this name is about to become really famous. So I registered it. And uh, didn't do you know didn't do much with it. I just kind of put some some Twitter feeds on there. Just thought, well, you know, see see what what comes of this. And uh, a little while later, um, as things developed, um, and he ended up you know in Russia. I, I was contacted by by some of his team that said, you know, we're putting together a legal defense fund. It'd be great if we could host it at edwardstone.com. You know, what could we buy the domain from you? And I was like, you can have it. You know, I'll donate it. I just sort of grabbed it because I figured this might come in handy someday. Uh, just kind of as an impulse, and uh, and so they said, great, you know, thank you, uh, Edward, thanks you, like we're gonna we're gonna really use this, you know, f this domain for his legal defense fund web page and all that stuff. And so over time, I just occasionally would, would ping him and say, look, uh, you know, the, the domain's free, you've got it, like I want you to have it. It's not my name. I don't have any need, need, I don't have any right to this, you know. So you guys use it, but it would be great if you could come on the summit thing that we do. So this was like three or four years ago, and they, they were like, oh yeah, he, he would love to do it, you know, to thank you for, for kind of donating the, uh, donating the domain. But each time we talked, it was always like the schedule didn't line up. And so I've been literally asking him for like six or seven summits. Yeah. And this was the first time the schedule signed up. And I had to tell anybody, because I thought, you know, this is never going to happen, and this is a pipe dream, and I don't want to promise anything. So it was only just a few weeks ago that we found out, okay, the schedule's lined up, it's on, and uh, got connected from there. And you know, he, he's obviously an open source person, has, has a lot of uh, passion behind that. We thought this is, this is pretty interesting for our audience, so, so it worked out. All right, so Jonathan, let, let, let's reset for a second here <laughs> uh, and, 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 and step back. Um, one of the things we love to see is the foundation is self-aware. Uh, there's always that balance when you get into yeah. is like, you know, you don't want to read the press or things like that because they don't understand what we're doing or where we're going or yeah. things like that. But in your opening keynote and throughout the show, um, we called it, it's a little bit of a reset. If, if you think about, uh, you know, where people thought OpenStack was and where it was going three years ago, it was like, oh, the Amazon this or the cheaper VMware or how yeah. that is. Where it is, where it's going, who's leading, who's involved, you know, the press winning and losing yeah. uh, type stuff. You guys did a good job of laying that out, so, so yeah, congrats on that. Why don't you take, take us in a little bit in what messages sure, you guys yeah. want to get out this week? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that, that you, uh, you're right, we are very self aware, and, and I think that some of that comes from our role is, you know, at the foundation, we are not selling a product. You know, we don't have, we don't have anything to, to, to sell off the back of the truck, so to speak. So what we actually really do care about is 
is um just kind of moving the the state of the community and the technology we produce forward. The thing that's great about that is you know we uh we can look at the portfolio of technologies that we have, we can look at the things that are in the market and uh and if we see a shift there, it's not like we have a 500 million dollar line of business that uh-oh, you know, we need to keep milking this cash cow and not and sort of like turn a blind eye to these changes over here. And so so I think you know over the last couple of years um, I, I talked about a shift in, in kind of what private clouds can do now and how they're built and operated. And we've seen that and we've sort of been um, teasing that out a little bit at previous summits, whether it's demos with, uh, with, with Kubernetes or different integrations with uh, Cloud Foundry and, and other things like that. But what we decided this time is coming out of last year, there's a lot of news and um, what, we, what we saw really kind of picking up is there would be these rumors or misperceptions that would that somebody would put out there, you know, and uh, and not based on fact, not based on reality. And we were like, you know what? We can't just sort of try to subtly hint at what's going on. Let's just go out there and actually address the state of things. And I think what you mentioned is is actually what's at at the root of a lot of these these misconceptions is people look at at open source now because so much technology gets developed that way. They look at it and they expect it to be like the old world of IT, where you need to have Microsoft versus Linux, and you need to have you know uh, Oracle versus MySQL. And and actually, you know what what we see is just the cloud overall is growing so quickly. Public cloud, everybody believes that's growing. What we see is private clouds are growing, and we see that uh, can servers. There are more servers this year than there were last year. There are more virtual machines this year than there were last year. Far more containers this year than last year. All of these technologies are growing. And so it's not a zero-sum game where, um, you know, in order for OpenStack to succeed, AWS has to lose. And, um, and you know, I mean, that's, I think that, that we feel that way and we see that, but we realize that this is, we need to just go at, go at it directly. Yeah, uh, Mark, I, I've heard good feedback from people when you know core, where it is, uh, you know how it's matured. Uh, people like the component piece. So you'd be uh -huh. able to take some of the digital pieces, which my understanding they could do that before. It's just kind of being highlighted a bit. Yes. We talked about some of the open source days and you know Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes. The piece where we've he heard some people poking holes in is what Big Tent we discussed last sure. year. Uh, you know, Big Tent. If we poked a hole, is it dead? How do you, how do we <laughs> reposition that? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think, I think first of all, one of the things that sort of just this strange uh, stroke of luck that maybe turn, turned out to be bad luck was, you know, one of the, one of the few times when uh, a handful of developers kind of went off and organized something, gave it a, a random name, and the name really stuck. You know, it actually was almost too good of a name. So you heard Big Tent, everyone's just rolling off the tongue all the time. Big Tent, Big Tent, Big Tent. So everyone had to have an opinion about it, and it was like, this is a huge change. And it really wasn't meant to be a huge change. It wasn't even meant to be like, uh, sort of broadcast that widely to everyone who's like just observing OpenStack. That's just kind of what happens. You know, people talk about it. And so I do think that um, we are entering a point now when we're thinking about composable open infrastructure. Yes, you need to have different components. You need to be able to pick them. But we, we're also getting more serious about what things need to exist in OpenStack. I talked about that a little bit this morning. Not every single thing that we've ever launched needs to continue to be an OpenStack project. And so, you know, whether you call it the Big Ten or not, or if you if you give it different names, you know, the reality is, you know, we need to adopt and integrate technologies from other communities. And there's that's a any open source community out there is potentially developing something really did, powerful. Did you mention the etcd thing this morning? And your I can't remember. Uh, if you... Yeah, I mentioned I mentioned it briefly. But you know, a perfect example of this is a lot of OpenStack services have said, you know, we need a distributed lock management function, like in order to to, to evolve as a service. Where should we go build it? How are we going to write it? And, and then that, this kind of culture of, well, hold on, there's, there are a lot of them out there. They're proven. What about etcd? And so the forum, which is the first time we've really had a dedicated space, space at the summit for both developers and operators to be in the same room, not just like next door to each other, they had a discussion yesterday on this, and they said, yes, we're going to go forward with etcd. That's an open source project, very proven. It solves this particular function. It's not developed inside of OpenStack, but that's who cares? You know, it's open source. We can work. We can be friends with anybody who who builds great open source software. And let's not reinvent the wheel. So I think that rec does represent a bit of a shift in the philosophy and culture in OpenStack of not trying to like you know just build every single thing from scratch because that's not that's not the best thing for our users or the market. I think the ecosystem message and the landscape message came through really clearly. Uh, this is my first OpenStack summit. 
uh, I was very curious about what is the shape of OpenStack? Where does it fit in? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, talking about uh, the, the upper layers and Kubernetes and the app layers and now talking about the overall landscape. Right, you know, why, why rewrite something like etcd, right? The, the whole a whole ecosystem has grown up around OpenStack during the seven years you guys have been, the whole, the whole uh, foundation has been working on it, all the, all the members. Um, one thing that impressed me, we are kind of post-hype cycle. There are real customers here. There are people building their first clouds right now on mm -hmm. OpenStack. Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, just the community in general, the composition of it, and the, the actual real use cases that we're seeing uh, happen? Yeah, um, so we had, uh, we had some new companies that spoke here for the first time. GE was, was one. Uh, the U.S. Army Cyber School was another one. We had some companies that, that came back as well. But I think, I think that you, you hit on a, a key point, which is the maturity of the software. Uh, you know, a company like GE, especially in their healthcare division, this is a highly regulated uh, company. It's probably the most regulated company out there when you consider the things they do with aviation and nuclear power and healthcare and finance and all of these things. Like they don't, they don't take those decisions lightly at all. Um, and so I think that is an indicator of, of that maturity. Uh, and what, what we see in the makeup of the community is, uh, is a broader set of industries than ever before. We had strong representation among IT companies um, early on and continued with that. But now we have uh, industrial companies, we have manufacturing companies like Volkswagen, BMW, you know, a number of car manufacturers, and uh, defense companies. And I think that, that that kind of plays into that. I think the other thing that, that we've seen when, when we talk about the OpenStack community and, and the platform overall, we think of it as an ecosystem that sort of has three main parts. There's the, the users, which that's why we exist. You know, we create software for it to be used. Um, there are the developers who are doing that. And then there's the ecosystem of companies who create commercial products and services. And I think that that's actually just as important right now at the phase that we're at is, is how that is also reaching maturity. In the early days of OpenStack, I think that uh, that we had a lot of startups and we had a lot of activity, but um, you know the market didn't know how to consume it. It didn't understand what it was, and uh, and I think that actually kind of scared off some companies and, and it made it a little bit more confusing. But as you get a few years into that, some of those companies succeed, some of them don't succeed. But what you arrive at is a clear understanding of what the market wants, how the products should shape up. You get companies that stop trying to build it all themselves, kind of along with the not invented here, and they partner with, with people who know how to do open source, or they you know, come up with new delivery models. So I think that actually just as important is, is the maturing that we've seen in, in the commercial ecosystem, because that leads to sustainable uh, business models for, for these companies, like. Red Hat and Rackspace and others, you know, that are then drive the development, but it also leads to clear adoption choices for users. Yeah. One of the things that I came out of last year uh, at the Austin Summit was just where OpenStack fits in in this hybrid world. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think about you know GE, Rackspace, Red Hat. All of those companies clearly span, you know, both sides of it. Um, back to that like winning and losing discussion we had yeah. at the beginning. It was like always public cloud versus, you know, the the private and the infrastructure piece. And we know it's a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud world. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that fitting and in the conversations? Uh, and the other piece on that, I, I see a large number, you know, it was 74% of deployments, according to your latest survey, are not US, which kind of is the inverse of we see such, you know, mm -hmm. North yes. America is where we have a lot of public cloud adoption. Mm -hmm. So does that fit in? What, do you, what, what, what dynamics maybe start with you, Mark? You know? Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of things I would say that uh, what we're finding is, you know, a few years ago it was like, are we going to do cloud? Okay, now it's yes. Then it was, you know, which app's going to be, it's going to be, you know, as many as we can get. And now it's, you know, are, and then it was, are we going to do public or private? Well, we picked one. And now it's, okay, yes to everything. It's going to be cloud, we're going to put as many apps as we can, we're going to do public and private. So what happens next? Now, it's a question of where. Where do you place each workload? And some of them belong in the public cloud, some of them don't. Economics plays a big factor, performance, you know, compliance, all the things that he said, the three C's, capabilities. And so, I think that uh, that's the next, the next, discussion point that's happening inside of these, these boardrooms and CTOs and, and IT leaders at the major companies is how do we get a sophisticated strategy for where to place the workload? And then in terms of the, the geographic dynamic, I think one of the things Jonathan uh, hit on uh, yesterday is that you know we start, it's just the nature of open source that you never know where it's going to go. You just have no clue. 
really any, any new technology development, the market's going to go somewhere you could have never predicted. Like the crystal ball is kind of dead. Uh, it's really roadmaps are, are almost kind of obsolete. It's like you need to create a structure for how you, you respond and adapt to change because you, you know it's coming. And so what's happened with OpenStack is it's been used in all these new and different ways, and part of that's geographic. You know, it's used to power cell phone networks in, in all these different countries. It's being used to fit within regulatory requirements in certain countries and data locality, uh, both for performance and, and, and other reasons. So yeah. I think that's why you see it. You know, it's a big world out there, and more than 74% of the world uh, doesn't live in the United <laughs> States. So I think we're, we're closer to the, the, the real percentage out there. Please. I want to jump in with one thing that I that I uh, that you said that I I might disagree with slightly. Oh, okay, let's have a debate. <laughs> On um, the right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you said that, you know, like th these are the conversations that that CTOs and CIOs are having as a strategy about how to do it. I think it's a conversation they should be having. Okay, fair point. But I think that, you know, what we see is we, we see a lot after of companies after they hear this. Yes, after they hear this. They'll start talking about the right thing. But I think that um, that, you know, we 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 see that but we are kind of on the front edge of cloud adoption That's a good point. in in the OpenStack community. I concede your point. Sir. <laughs> and I think that that one of the issues that that we see still is that people are thinking about it too simplistically almost, you know, and and as Larry Ellison famously said, you know, the IT industry is is the most Fashion-driven industry out there, and uh, and I think that right now, you know, there are a lot of a lot of companies that they still think that there's some shiny object that's going to fix it all for them. And right now, it might it's be public cloud idea, but or containers. Really. They've heard this word and they think that's never happened. Never happened in the history of IT <laughs> ever before. There has never been a technology that came along and fixed the stuff before it. They all get added in. And I think so. Yes, you know what we we talked to we were. Um, you know, talking with a uh, with a CEO just uh, this week, and and it was really interesting to hear his perspective because you know he said that he actually thinks that the pendulum is going to shift back towards private cloud for people who run any significant amount of software. And he goes, I know that is not a popular viewpoint right now. And if I you know if I said that to to most other you know technology C level execs they would probably disagree with me and go, no, cloud first containers. But I think that, you know, just the fundamentals behind it um, over the next few years, I think, I don't know if it'll shift all the way back. It may, who knows. But it's definitely something that I think is going to change from, from where the current fad might be. All right, well, we'll have to have you back later to talk about <laughs> how uh, public is now moving to edge, and edge, yeah. of course, oh, lives yes. as the new, edge is the new data center, yeah. is what they have. I do have one final question for you before we let you go. That whole new shiny stuff, the last couple of years, I've been hearing everybody's like, well, you know, containers are going to subsume and take over, and you know, DockerCon will be the new thing. Oh wait, you know, Kubernetes is just going to dominate and take it over, and we have KubeCon and the CNCF, and you know, there's lots of Linux Foundation shows that do uh, partnerships with what you're doing, Cloud yeah. Foundry Summit, uh, you know, and on all these other pieces. So. When, what do you see as the future for the OpenStack Summit? Does it get, you know, pulled? This it's being pulled into pieces, but for the show itself, for the foundation, and how it fits with that that whole yeah. broad ecosystem of open source. Well, the OpenStack Summit has always had uh, some specific purposes, and again, this gets back to the fact that we are an open source community and a, and a foundation built to support that open source community. So the primary purposes of the OpenStack Summit are basically to strengthen those three pillars that I, that I talked about earlier, especially on the software angle. Um, Mark mentioned that this time around, we are doing what we call the forum. We used to have the design summit here, and we actually split that into two parts. One that is, that's very technical, and, and it's really get, gets down into implementation details. That's split out into a separate event. It happened in February, it's going to happen in September. And what we did here is we set up time where developers and operators can get together and talk about strategic issues. So instead of talking about how do we fix this issue on line X of file Y, they're talking about sh what should we use for distributed storage and, and lock management? Should we do etcd? Should we do Z like they're having more strategic conversations? So you know that is a a very critical piece for our community and for the people who run on it. We do a lot of education here. I mean, I think that what what we've seen is that the OpenStack Summit is becoming more focused around users and kind of the, the strategic needs of them as, uh, as we build out the technology uh, versus what it used to be, which it originally started as, as a, uh, a hacking event for 
uh, 75 software developers. So you know that, that's where I think it's going. And and you you know just to address the other point, all of the uh, the other open source projects, um, a lot of them are here, and we go to their events because again, like we've been saying, you know, this is it's not a zero sum game. What we care about is that there are open alternatives and that they work well together. And one of the things that I think we've we've seen and and we've seen it proven over and over again with OpenStack is that getting communities together in person, those high bandwidth interactions are actually really critical to getting work done and, and making things happen. So I think, I think they're all valuable and, and we're going to continue to participate in all of them. Yeah. Well, Jonathan Bryce, Mark Collier, really appreciate you joining us. I'm sure we'll see you at many of those other shows that <laughs> yes. theCUBE uh, it will be covering through, throughout the years. Stay tuned with us. We've got lots more coverage here at OpenStack Summit 2017 in Boston. Thanks for watching theCUBE.